you'll hear shortly from our illustrious panelists who will go in with some depth about what experts from across the political spectrum obligations would be an unmitigated disaster, a disaster for the American economy, a disaster for the world's financial system, and cruelly, a disaster for the basic well-being of our families. A default would cause retirement portfolios to plummet, interest rate heights to spike, home buying costs would skyrocket. Moody's Analytics estimated that a default of even a few weeks could cause the loss of almost 6 million American jobs and $12 trillion in household wealth. Suffice to say, a default would be completely unacceptable. It's more than just a ball in some political game. Failing to raise the debt ceiling would wreak financial devastation on the American people. The first two years of the Biden administration have been two of the strongest years of job growth in American history. That's because of the remarkably successful American Rescue Plan, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the CHIPS Science Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, and so much more. Let's allow this legislation to keep delivering for American families. These policies are clearly making a meaningful difference. Republican proposals, in comparison, are so mean-spirited and dangerous that Kevin McCarthy's best shot at enacting them is to hold the debt, the debt ceiling hostage. There's no popular mandate or economic justification for their reckless plan. Instead of helping Americans in need, their plan would use paperwork requirements to deny access to SNAP, cut child care pro programs that allow parents to work and attack the most vulnerable amongst us. As leader Jeffries put it, McCarthy's plan is a ransom note written by extremists, not a serious budget. Plainly, a default means the government would fail its people. Let's explore all this and solutions to the crisis in more detail with our distinguished panel. Wendy Edelberg is the, is the director of the Hamilton Project, a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution and a principal at West Exec Advisors. She is the former chief economist at the Congressional Budget Office and previously directed the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission which investigated the causes of the 2008 recession. Dr. Edelberg also served at the President's Council of Economic Advisors during both the Bush and Obama administrations. Mark Zandi is chief economist at Moody's Analytics, where he oversees economic research. Dr. Zandi is the author of Paying the Price, Ending the Great Recession, and Beginning a New American Century. His other book, Financial Shock, a 360-degree look at the subprime mortgage implosion and how to avoid the next financial crisis, was described by the New York Times as the clearest guide to that crisis. Ben Harris is the former Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy and Chief Economist at the Department of Treasury. In this role, he closely advised Secretary Yellen, leading the Biden administration's effort to cap the price of Russian oil and helping to develop the Build Back Better legislation. Prior to joining Treasury, Dr. Harris was a professor at Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management and the chief economist to then Vice President Biden. He also previously advised the Biden campaign and was dubbed by the New York Times as the quiet architect of Biden's plan to rescue the economy. Today's discussion will be moderated by our very own inimitable Emily G, our senior vice president for inclusive growth here at CAP. Emily. Take it away. Patrick, thank you so much for those remarks um, and for underscoring the gravity of the situation that we're in today. Uh, good morning to our audience. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this conversation with economists Wendy Edelberg, Mark Zandi, and Ben Harris. Um, we're so happy to have you today. Um, and for those of you watching, I want to remind you that closed captioning is available throughout this discussion. Um, and you can also submit questions that we'll take at the end of the discussion um, using the Q&A feature. I, like the rest of the public and those of you watching this, have a lot of questions about the default crisis and exactly what would happen if our nation were to literally stop paying its bills. And that's no wonder because this is something that the United States has never intentionally done before. So it's no hyperbole to say that intentionally defaulting would be unprecedented and the ec enormous economic damage that we could expect to follow both for American families and the economy as a whole is something that we haven't seen. So I wanna start here with the basics. Secretary Yellen has said that the nation could hit the debt limit as, um, 
had said the day she could have hit the debt limit all the way back in January. And more recently, she said that the Treasury Department could exhaust so-called extraordinary measures that are underway um, as early as June 1st. Um, and absent congressional action, the US would no longer be able to borrow money to pay the bills that we normally are paying. So Ben, I wanna to turn to you first. Can you bring us up to date on where things stand today? Exactly how close to default are we? And um, can you also explain to us what does the X date really mean? Sure, and thanks for having me, Emily. Uh, this is a great panel. I will say that if I had a question about the economic consequences of default, Wendy and Mark would probably be the first two people I would call. So really happy to be on a panel with them today. I also have to say this panel shouldn't even have to happen in the first place. We've raised the debt ceiling almost 80 times since 1960. It has almost never turned into a political football uh, in large part because the absurdity of doing so. I mean, the notion that Congress would approve spending and then refuse to pay for the spending that it is already authorized is, is just a little crazy. I mean, you don't have to be a financial economist to know how absurd that is. And particularly given the high costs, it's even more absurd. Uh, but yet here we are today, and it looks like we're going to again go down to the wire, which is incredibly problematic for the US economy. So what is the, the X date? Uh, so just to give sort of like the 101 here, the debt ceiling dictates the aggregate amount of outstanding debt the US can maintain. Um, when we reach the, the, that limit, typically Congress does one of two things. It either puts in place a suspension period which where the debt ceiling is basically suspended until some date or just raises the aggregate amount of debt that can be issued. Uh, when we hit the debt ceiling and we're not in the suspension period, Emily, as you noted, um, this happened in January of this year, the Treasury Department has certain tools at its disposable, disposal to effectively elongate the amount of time it has until we actually hit the actual date at which the U.S. under no circumstances can pay uh, all of its bills. It really means we just can't issue any more debt. Uh, so when is the X date? So Secretary Yellen uh, is now in the mode where she's basically issuing a letter a week, giving updates. In her latest letter dated May 15th, she said, uh, with additional information now available, I'm writing to note that we still estimate that Treasury, Treasury will likely no longer be able to satisfy all the government's obligations if Congress has not acted to raise or suspend the debt limit by early June and potentially as early as June 1. So the key word there is likely. Uh, the X date could be as early as June 1st. Uh, on June 14th, there's a large social security payment that goes out. Um, on June 15th, we have the due date for estimated income tax payments. Uh, and so I think that most of the people who are doing sort of the day-to-day -day assessment think that if we can get past that June 15th date, uh, things look pretty good because we've got a lot of revenues coming in. On June 30th, I mentioned those extraordinary measures and basically the accounting um, maneuvers that the, that the Treasury can play. Uh, there's a big $145 billion new extraordinary measure that pops up at the end of June. So that can get us well into July, if not towards the end of it. Uh, so the real X date at this point right now looks like it'll be either the first two weeks of June and Secretary Yellen, who um, I've got to say is the most credible person I've ever met in my life, if she says is likely the first two weeks in June, is likely the first two weeks in June, but there is a chance that it could see past that and be with us for the rest of the summer. Um, there's also a chance that through congressional negotiations, I know we'll get into this in a moment, uh, the Congress could decide to give itself some extra time in its negotiations with the administration and pass a short-term suspension that might take us uh, later on in the summer or even towards the end of the fiscal year or later. So there's a ton of uncertainty over something with enormous consequences. And um, the combination of those two things is just awful for the U.S. economy. So I know we'll get to that, but uh, that's, that's where we are as far as today. Thank you so much, Ben. Among the many unknowns is what would the Treasury actually do day to day operating when the debt limit is binding? Uh, Wendy, you recently published a paper that answered that exact question. So I was curious if you could walk us through exactly how you answered that. Um, and, uh, you know, beside the Treasury, what happens to the federal workforce or Social Security recipients who are waiting for checks in the mail? Um, does the debt limit have an exception for essential things like national defense? 
And Wendy, you'll have to take yourself on. Thank yes, you. I see that. Um, I should say I'm also very, I'm both a combination of very happy to be here and very sad to be here. Uh, I think like Ben, um, but uh, it's an important question that you're asking. The effects of a debt ceiling crisis are unambiguously negative and could be quite severe for families and households and businesses and the health of the economy more broadly. It is widely assumed that Treasury would continue to make timely principal and interest payments on the debt. And to do that, they would likely need to cut non-interest payments by at least 35%. So, so what they would do is hold aside all of the non-interest payments due on a particular day, let's say on Tuesday's non-interest payments, and wait until they had enough revenues accumulated in the checking account. You should really think of it as a checking account. Uh, to be able to make all of Tuesday's non-interest payments all at once so they didn't prioritize one non-interest payment over another. Um, the, I'm just assuming that this is the playbook they would follow because it's outlined in some documents that have been made public from the 2011 go around. But of course, we don't really know what Treasury would do. The only effective solution to, to uh, avoiding this crisis is to increase the debt ceiling without delay or better yet, abolish it. Um, I mean, the short the, the, the short story here is that U.S. taxpayers owe people money because of legislation enacted in the past. We can talk about what kinds of recent legislation have, push, have pushed up uh, federal borrowing means. But in fact, some of this legislation was passed 90 years ago. We, we owe interest to those who have lent to the U.S. Uh, by purchasing treasury securities. We owe doctors and hospitals who have treated Medicare and Medicaid patients money. And millions of people are entitled to benefits. In fact, there are 4 million disabled veterans whose payments are scheduled for June 1st, and those payments are now uncertain. And because the U.S. runs a deficit, Treasury needs to increase federal debt to meet its obligations. So should the debt ceiling bind, the negative economic effects would risk triggering a deep recession. How bad it could get is really uncertain. It depends how long the situation lasts how it's managed, for example, if Treasury does follow the playbook I just outlined, and how much investors lose their faith in Treasuries. So, you know, we can ask the question, would the stock market crash the first day that a non-interest payment is delayed? Uh, I should say if an interest payment is delayed, and there was no way to understand that other than the U.S. being in default on its debt, I think that the repercussions in financial markets would be would be quite severe. Uh, we're also worried about money market funds. Would there be a run on money market funds that hold short-term treasury securities? If people expect a short-lived impasse with full and timely payments on treasury securities, it is possible that the initial response in financial markets could be muted. But even if the crisis only lasts a few days, the damage could be lasting. And at the very least, my guess is that investors would anticipate short-term interruptions in federal payments each time the debt limit nears, which would just be a massive escalation compared to their current expectations for negotiations to run right up to the last minute. If the impasse were to drag on, market conditions would likely worsen with each passing day as optimism about resolving the crisis wanes and pessimism about a deep recession expands. Entitlement benefits could be uh, it could be delayed further, and that would mean beneficiaries would start to face trouble with paying their rent, paying utilities, government agencies' work could be disrupted. Federal employees, which it's important to note, would be required to work because the government would not be shut down, wouldn't know how long their paychecks would be delayed. And moreover, revenues would be dampened, uh, quite ironically, worsening the fiscal outlook. Uh, and necessary cuts to spending would be exacerbated. My last point is that the reputation to the Treasury securities market would be up, undermined. So up until now, the U.S. government has enjoyed a borrowing rate that is estimated to be about a quarter percentage point lower than other countries uh, because of the enormous safety and liquidity of the U.S. Treasury market. That means a 750 billion dollar savings for taxpayers over the next decade. If even a portion of that advantage went away because of an impasse, uh, that, would be, that could be a big cost to taxpayers. And already we're seeing concerns in financial markets. For treasury bills that are scheduled to mature in June, investors are demanding a significant premium 
of nearly one percentage point to shoulder the risk for not being paid on time. So this is a, a crisis that absolutely demands our attention today. Thanks, Wendy. And I really appreciate you made that point that it's not just about financial markets and major investors. It's really, there are effects for individual households who are receiving checks from fellow government or um, people who as taxpayers are going to pay the costs of default. Um, I want to turn to Mark. Um, I think there's a, not a day in the last few weeks, Mark, when I haven't turned on the TV or the radio and heard about the really important uh, modeling that you and Moody's have done around uh, the consequences of default for households, um, including unemployment uh, consequences, lost savings, and the like. Could you please walk us through what your re research says about how default might affect the economy, uh, but with a focus on what that, what that means for families, individuals across America? Sure, Emily. Uh, and that's my goal, by the way, uh, so that you can't get away from me. So uh, that's my goal. It's good to be with you and good to be with uh, CAP and uh, the great panel. Uh, it's just a wonderful panel to be to be on. So I appreciate that. Um, uh, let me say by my calculation, uh, the X date is June 8th. Uh, June 1, we get pretty close. That's the earliest uh, we could breach. Uh, the Treasury will, will run out of cash, not be able to pay everyone on time, uh, but the most likely date is, uh, I think, uh, June the 8th. Um, in terms of the uh, economic consequence, uh, I, you know, let me kind of lay out how things might play out here and what it might mean for the economy and for the average American household. My sense is if there's no agreement by this time next week uh, and lawmakers are uh, speaking uh, they're not speaking nice. They're not send, sending uh, signals that they're going to come to a, an agreement. Like we've heard some pretty nice things today and it feels pretty good. But if a week from now, they still haven't gotten it across the finish line and uh, and, and the rhetoric has turned darker, I think at that point, we'll start to see the impacts on financial markets. Uh, the, the equity market, the stock market has kind of ignored all of this, at least up to this point. But I don't think that'll be the case a week from now. Uh, if we get to the other side of Memorial Day and there is no agreement, I think 2011 feels like a pretty good, uh, the debt limit drama around 2011, a pretty good uh, case study for what would happen. I think the market will be down 15 to 20 percent. Uh, that's what happened back in 2011. There were a couple of days back then when the the, the market fell 5 percent. And just to kind of make that uh, uh, square that with uh, the, the the market today, that would mean we'd have a day or two where the Dow Jones Industrial Average is down about 1,500 points. Um, so that would be quite significant. Uh, the damage at that point would be our 401ks would be diminished, our wealth would be diminished. Uh, it, at that point, interest rates would be a bit higher on corporate bar corporate debt and uh, probably on mortgages. Um, it'll be a little bit more difficult to get credit. I mean, of course, the banking system is already under a lot of pressure and tightening down standards, and this would just further exacerbate the banking system's concerns and make credit even uh, more difficult. Uh, if at that point lawmakers don't come to terms and we actually breach, then uh, there are a lot of different scenarios, but let me focus on two. One would be what I call a short breach uh, for a few days. And I think what would happen it, and when I say breach, I mean, uh, Treasury is going to miss a payment. They're not going to make a payment to somebody. Now, my guess is they'll prioritize the Treasury debt, uh, that they'll pay on the debt, because not doing so, that would take this to a whole nother level immediately. So I think they'd pay on the debt uh, and uh, uh, they would, uh, uh, everyone else would get paid late, uh, according to the script that uh, Wendy laid out. Um, uh, it, at that point, I think markets would kind of lose their minds. And the analog there would be TARP. Remember TARP? That was the bailout uh, around the financial crisis. Lawmakers voted that down initially. Markets lost it. Uh, that put such tr tremendous pressure on lawmakers that they reversed course and uh, agreed to TARP. Uh, but the damage was done, uh, you know, very significant uh, fallout from that. That's the kind of thing that I think would happen here. And, uh, you know, within a few days, a week, uh, uh, lawmakers would figure out a way to increase the limit and and uh, end, uh, end that uh, part of the crisis. But 
I think that would be enough to push us into recession. The, uh, you know, the, as I mentioned, the economy, and as we all know, the economy is already very fragile. The consensus of economists, not me, but the consensus of economists think recession is more likely than not, uh, and uh, uh, very difficult to avoid a downturn when you uh, lay on top of it, you know, all the turmoil that would occur here. The other thing that would happen is uh, interest rates would be higher uh, uh, going forward. Uh, you know, investors are going to ask themselves, well, what about next time? I mean, you guys decided to you know, breach this time. Now, what about next time and the time after that and the time after that? And investors are going to demand a, a risk premium on uh, buying treasury debt. And that's going to be embedded in interest rates going forward. I don't think that's going to be 10, 20, 30 basis points on a 10-year treasury bond, but that'll be four, five, six, seven, eight basis points on a treasury bond. And you, with $30 trillion plus in debt outstanding over time, that becomes real money. Um, then finally, the, the other scenario would be a, a, a what I would call a prolonged breach scenario where it goes on for a few weeks. Uh, hard to imagine lawmakers would get to this place, but, you know, what we're talking about now, all of it's unimaginable, so probably worthwhile considering it. Uh, and in a prolonged breach over a few weeks, uh, that would mean um, a very severe economic downturn. We can kind of walk through all the mechanics of that if you'd like. Uh, a lot of moving parts there. But the one thing I'd point out is once you go down that path, uh, it puts such pressure on the on the financial system and the economy, things break that we're not even anticipating. Uh, we can kind of anticipate the banking system is going to be retreating pretty quickly, but there's things in the shadow system, the non-bank part of the system that is already fragile. Things will break and exacerbate, you know, the economic downturn, and it'll be on par with, uh, I, I think, the analog there, uh, the case study there would be the financial crisis itself. Where, you know, we'd lose millions of jobs, unemployment would get into the high single digits. Uh, it would be we uh, massive loss of wealth. Uh, it would be very serious, and of course, longer run. In that case, we would be talking about permanently higher interest rates, and here it would be tens of basis points higher to Wendy's, you know, a quarter twenty-five basis point estimate. And 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 beyond that, it goes beyond the economics. It does erode our geopolitical status, our reserve currency status, which is. People don't understand how significant a deal that is. I mean, we benefit enormously from that, particularly in times of crisis when things go bad, uh, money comes flowing in, and that really cushions the blow for us. And of course, we would uh, lose all of that if we went down uh, down this path. So, um, you know, I think the odds of those breach scenarios are still pretty low, uh, but they're non-zero and uh, something certainly uh, to consider uh, uh, here in the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Ben, as the former Treasury official here in the room, uh, I want to ask you a little bit to expand a little bit more on that outsized role that U.S. Treasury securities and the dollar play in the global economy. Uh, how might, uh, for the long term, a default affect the global economy um, trade? And are there foreign uh, policy or national security effects that we should be worried about? Yeah, uh, thanks for that great question. Before I get to it, let me just, I, I agree with everything that Wendy said. I, I wanna also though um, reiterate something that she mentioned, which was the assumption right now in financial markets are that if we breach the X state, that you would see a prioritization where you would see a firewall of payments on principal and interest the way she described, where there was no intraday prioritization, you wait till you have enough money to pay all the non p &I bills and then you pay them. But that's just an assumption. And a lot of times financial markets, when I speak to people in financial markets, they'll point to this 2013 transcript where that was two administrations ago and the Fed talking about what they thought Treasury would do. This is really a decision for the president uh, if and how he would want to prioritize. And so this is not locked in stone. Prioritization is not locked in stone. And if we get to uh, if we get past the X state, there's going to be some really tough, difficult decisions uh, that the president has to make. But um, just to say, this is not, you know, this is not 100% uh, prioritization, firewalling of P&I is not 100% in terms of an outcome. But back to your great question about global markets. I mean, as Mark said, the United States has benefited enormously 
from our position as the uh, global reserve currency. And you know this wouldn't erode overnight, but right now U.S. Uh, you know U.S. currency makes up about 60% of the world's uh, global reserve, with euro making up about 20% and China's RMB making up about 3%. So you could see over the next five or 10 years, perhaps quite quite soon, if markets lose faith in treasuries as a risk-free asset. And I think that's what's underappreciated so much about this current situation is we could be in the middle of the beginning of markets no longer regarding treasuries as having no credit risk. And not only have we benefited that enormously in terms of the global reserve currency, but we've had much lower interest rates, has already been pointed out. Uh, this would be incredibly disruptive if, if the world begins to move away from that. Uh, the dollar would depreciate um, and you could see the shakeup of global trading patterns pretty acutely. There's other things, so th that's kind of unknown and uncertain, uh, but there's a few things I think are more certain and will almost certainly happen that are sort of related to us potentially surrendering our, our fortunate position uh, in terms of, of the reserve currency. The first is that after this is all done, it's not necessarily going to be quickly resolved with no hiccups. And so Treasury will have to unwind all of these extraordinary measures that it's been engaging in, and it's gonna to need to raise a lot of cash quickly because it's just not responsible for Treasury to have no cash on hand. There are policies about how much Treasury needs to have. So you would see Treasury having to issue a lot of debt quickly after a resolution. Bank of America said that this was equivalent, economically equivalent to about a 25 basis point hike. This is really a difficult time to have a forced, basically a forced increase in, in interest rates. Uh, and the second thing I think is also maybe underappreciated is the injection of additional policy uncertainty. So if the notion is every time that we reach the X state, that the party that's not in the White House will be able to hold the whole US economy hostage, I mean, that injects enormous uncertainty. Right now we're seeing, for example, if you look at the Republican bill, one of the things that, uh, one of the major revenue raisers is a repeal of all the investment incentives for clean energy production. And a lot of businesses have undertaken investment already with the assumption that the IRA was permanently and permanently in law. And so if you're going around and every 18 months is dramatically changing the US tax code and ripping out incentives, you already promised the business. I mean, you know, there's a lot of reasons people like doing business in the United States, but one reason is we have the rule of law, it's dependable, and you know, you get paid on your treasury securities. If we're surrendering that all overnight, uh, I really worry about what that means about attractiveness of, of investing in our country. So um, some things are uncertain, uh, but some things are, are known. And the scope of the uncertainty, again, is just, is just terrifying. Thanks, Ben. It is indeed terrifying. Uh, I, I want to switch up uh, with the next question think, from thinking about sort of the pure economic uh, dynamics to so thinking more of the political dynamics. I mean, this is happening in the context of Washington. Um, and I'm going to put this to Wendy. You know, we, we have been through contentious debates around the debt limit before, notably during the Obama administration as well. Can you speak a little bit more about the implications for our systems of governing? If every time the nation nears a debt limit, the party that's not in control of the executive branch gets to hold you know, the, the executive branch hostage essentially to achieve policy outcomes that would not be otherwise possible um, through a, you know, a control, of the control of Congress. Well, I suppose the naive hope is that this episode uh, serves as a wake up call to uh, to policymakers that the next time uh, one party holds or when when the political toxicity, you know, wanes and or uh, the next time one party is in control of both the House and the Senate and the presidency, they just abolish the debt ceiling. Um, I think what's more worrying um, is that I think both parties right now uh, may be thinking that if this crisis indeed comes to pass, which isn't to say that they want it to come to pass, but it may well be that both parties think that if the crisis comes to pass, the other side will be the one hurt politically. And my guess is that those sorts of political calculations will always be with us. 
Um, and and you know the 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 challenge here just to to piggyback a little bit on what Ben was talking about in terms of how financial markets will respond is that and and how households and businesses will respond is that even if Treasury makes principal and interest payments, that is not like people who are holding treasury securities or thinking about investing in treasury securities shrug and say, well, at least I'm whole, so it's all good for me. Um, first of all, they will lose faith in just, you know, whether or not Congress can do just the most basic aspects of governing. Second of all, there is enormous legal uncertainty whether in the in the in the ideas that I laid out about Treasury prioritizing principal and interest, it's not at all clear that they legally can. But it's also not clear that they're legally allowed to not make any of the payments. And in fact, already a lawsuit's been filed. And so even if, like on June 1st, uh, Treasury makes the principal payment that I believe is due that day but doesn't pay the vet, you know, doesn't make the veterans payment, doesn't make the payment for social security, uh, supplemental security income that's due. Um, my guess is that there will be enormous uncertainty in lawsuits about, you know, created in the legal system about whether or not even that simple prioritization is legal. And so financial markets will be watching closely to see whether or not I mean, one things get once things get wrapped up in the Supreme Court, you know, all bets are off. Who knows how things are going to land? Uh, and so, um, I I couldn't agree more with what Ben was talking about in terms of how this creates uh, an environment of just crazy uncertainty about policy lurching from 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 place to place, and just you know, it, we. It, how a firm or an international investor could could plan in this environment is just beyond me. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, one of those lurches on the table would be for policy is the plan that Kevin McCarthy and some House Republicans had put forward. Um, Mark, you had analyzed that and had looked at specifically the impact on jobs and growth over the next decade. Can you walk us through your findings on what that would mean for individuals and families and for the economy as a whole? Yeah, sure. Let me say, going back to the thing, this discussion around prioritization of treasury debt, which I think is a very important point. One thing to, to uh, uh, recognize is if the treasury debt is downgraded, uh, then uh, there will be widespread downgrades. So any uh, entity that is uh, backstopped by the federal government implicitly, explicitly or implicitly will get downgraded. So that would be the federal home loan bank system, which as we know are, is critical to providing funding to the banking system currently. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, which is critical to the mortgage market and uh, by extension, the housing market. Uh, municipalities, uh, every systemically important financial institution, you know, think JP Morgan Chase, the uh, chaos that would create would be uh, incalculable. We, we, we would immediately go to uh, a very severe financial crisis economic downturn. That's why it makes it you know difficult to think that that would happen that, that that's where Treasury would go. Now having said that, to Wendy's point, it, 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 you know to some degree it doesn't matter because global investors are going to say to themselves, okay, I'm a Chinese investor in treasury debt. I'm a Saudi investor in treasury debt. How long is it going to be that I'm going to get paid ahead of the military or VA or you know, even the electric bill for the federal building in Omaha, Nebraska? Does that make sense to anybody, uh, certainly politically? So that means you'd still see chaos, but uh, it is important to recognize that the uh, the uh, the downgrades that would occur would be you know quite uh, dramatic. Okay, with that as a point of interest, I, I turning to the Limit Save Grow Act. That's the uh, name for the legislation that the House Republicans put forward here. Uh, I, I'm not a fan for lots of reasons, but the, the you know from a macroeconomic perspective, the uh, biggest problem is it leads to very significant 
cuts to government spending uh, in, in the legislation. It's discretionary spending, but in all likelihood, it would be non-defense, non-VA discretionary spending. Uh, and it would begin in the fourth quarter of this year when the economy, again, is in incredibly vulnerable. I mean, the consensus view of economists, again, not me, but the consensus view is that even without this de debt limit drama, we're going into recession at the end of this year. So, you know, we're just uh, making sure that that's going to happen uh, uh, with this piece of uh, legislation, if you if you if you if it was implemented as uh, uh, written into into the uh, into the legislation, the other thing to consider is it doesn't solve any long term fiscal issues. I mean, at the end of the day, what we're here, you know, the the thinking is well, we can use the debt limit drama to make some fundamental changes to put our long term fiscal situation on a more sustainable basis. And by the way, it's not sustainable. We do need to make changes. We need more tax revenue. We need to address spending going forward to be able to put our uh, fiscal house in order. But this mechanism of the debt limit drama is not helping in that regard. You can see it in the Limit Safe Grow Act because all of the cutting is in discretionary spending, non-defense, non-VA discretionary spending. And that's definitely not where the problem is, right? Because if you look at that as a share of GDP, it's no higher today than it was 30, 40, maybe 50 years ago. And under current law, current law, it's going to decline as a share of a percentage of GDP. And by the way, when I say percentage, we're going from 3% of GDP to 2% of GDP. And we're, we're cutting things that, you know, I think almost anyone who sat down and took a look at it would say, really, we're going to do that? You know, we're going to cut education, transportation, housing, NASA, national parks, air traffic control. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So and it doesn't solve any of our problems long term. So, you know, the, the piece... The legislation is, I think, just, um, you know, a, the wrong way to approach, uh, you know, our current uh, both near term macroeconomic issues and our longer term fiscal issues. Thank you, Mark. We have a number of questions that have been coming in uh, via the, the Q&A feature um, in, 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 in the webinar, um, which I would love to get to. Um, Right before that, I want to do one quick round of uh, answers from you all um, on a question uh, uh, which I have, which is, um, we know that the simplest way out of this, if Congress were willing to do it, would be a clean debt ceiling increase, right? We'll just get us out of this problem. Absent that, we've heard a lot of about other options that Congress might take if, uh, that, sorry, the administration might take if Congress fails to act. Um, one is the 14th Amendment, that I think Wendy brought up earlier, um, you know, minting a platinum coin, there are others. Uh, so my question for you is, if you were advising President Biden or Secretary Yellen, what advice would you give them? And what are the trade-offs that you would weigh in making that decision? I would say don't use any of these workarounds. They are all, all a terrible idea. I like Ben go next. <laughs> uh, yeah, so until like six weeks ago, I was advising Secretary Yellen. I mean, the problem <laughs> to sort of build on Wendy's point, the, the problem with the platinum coin, the 14th Amendment, premium bonds, they really don't solve the full problem in that they still introduce enormous uncertainty into financial markets. I mean, if you're an investor and you're buying treasuries because you need a risk-free asset, are you really dying to go buy treasuries under a cloud of, of legal uncertainty? I think the answer is, is obviously no. Um, and, and I will say, just to, again, digress. It's really easy. This is such a complicated issue. To, it's easy to digress. One thing I think is underappreciated as a risk is the risk of a failed auction. And if we get a failed auction, it is just game over. And so we've actually come fairly close in the past. We came fairly close during the great financial crisis to a failed auction. And this is basically- And you have to explain what a failed auction is. What you yeah, mean? so you know, every, every, uh, at a regular, regular intervals, the US Treasury needs to issue new debt. And a lot of times that's because debt has expired. So either they issued a 10 year bond or a four week bill or for whatever reason it's expired and they need to go ahead and pay off the investor, but then replace that. And so there's these treasury auctions which are pulled off with enormous ease, very few ripples. Um, but you're already starting to see stress in the, in the, in the auction for treasuries. And Wendy noted this early on. So for a four week bill, 
that was auctioned off in uh, early May and would mature four weeks later, we already saw the highest rate that investors have ever demanded on that bill. And so you're already seeing stress in these markets. And so if it gets to the point where investors say, look, we just don't want to buy these things. And if you, if you, can't, if you don't get bids for the whole amount that you are uh, intending to get and Treasury sets those amounts before it has the auction, it's my understanding that none of the debt will be issued. So if you don't get at least a full, a full uh, plate of, of bids for however much you're trying to auction, the auction doesn't go off. And that means that all these questions around prioritization become so much worse because you, you can't, maybe you can't even make the PI payments now. Um, and so it really exacerbates a problem very, very quickly. But as far as, I mean, I agree with Wendy, I think that the, the key thing right now is for policymakers to make the case, the American public, that look, we know we need to talk about debt and deficits. House Republicans had a $4.8 trillion plan, which makes uh, some really, I think, short sighted cuts. As, as Mark was laying out, but President Biden also has a plan to reduce the deficit by $3 trillion with a, with a different approach. This is an important conversation to have, but just not under the threat of burning our entire economy down. I mean, that's just, that's just irresponsible. So uh, I think Secretary Yellen and the president have done a great job of explaining why this is so problematic uh, to the American people. We've been through this before, uh, and you know, almost every time Congress has raised the debt ceiling. So. Um, I don't know what the outcome will be, but I agree these workarounds are problematic for a, a ton of reasons. Hey, Emily, let me, uh, there, I think there's one scenario, a scenario where the workaround makes, and I agree very much with the, each of these ideas have lots of problems, uh, some more than others. I mean, the platinum coin doesn't make any sense to me. I think that that uh, changes the DNA of our the way we the government operates and in, in, in a way that who knows what that means the premium bond I, you know that that's another idea i won't go into it but you know that, i don't think that scales to any significant degree it doesn't solve the problem 14th amendment i think there is a scenario where that may make sense and that is if we breach and it looks like for whatever reason lawmakers are not going to come together then you got to make a decision you 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 have to have, you have a Hobson's choice, a Sophie's choice. There's no good choice, but you're going to take the least bad choice. And in that case, you may decide 14th Amendment. I'm going to take my chances with that, and you are taking your chances with it because uh, between the time the when the president invokes it and the Supreme Court rules, and who knows how long that's going to take, there's going to be extreme uncertainty. We may get a busted auction, um, you know, because are those bonds issued in that period? Full faith and credit, uh, you know, I'm not sure. I'm an investor. I'm not sure. So there's a lot of risk around that. But at the end of the day, uh, if the president uh, wins, uh, you know, we got rid of this crazy thing called the debt limit. And you know, I'm not a constitutional lawyer. I like playing one, but I'm not. You know, and I've read both sides of of this, and they're both convincing. But I, I, I'll just take the simplistic economist perspective. How can it be constitutional for the U.S. government not to pay its debts? I, I just, how's that possible? So I think at the end of the day, the president would win that, but obviously a boatload of risk around that. And you would you would not go down that path unless you thought the alternative was an even darker path. But there's no, I think this is worth going into for a minute more. I'm not, I can't see how the alternative is darker in the sense in terms of so so mark you had laid out that there's basically there's a world in which there's a short-term impasse and the reactions to that short-term impasse discipline lawmakers to come together and act there's a world in which there's a long-term impasse in which case you know we're probably talking a hundred years from now about how this is a pivot point of like the 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 trajectory of the u.s economy and the global you know in the global system. Um, when we're talking about the short-term impact, the reason that there's a negative impact in the short term is yes, it's partly because of the uh, it's partly because of delays in non-interest payments and maybe even delays in interest payments. But it's really there's a the short-term impact is negative because of the effects on confidence, because of the uncertainty it creates. It is um, 
it's all of those things about, you know, what does this mean for future policy? Those are all the things that create the short-term impact, the short-term effects. By invoking the 14th Amendment and overnight without any like, you know, without laying all of the groundwork for this slowly and quietly and not under crisis, by just saying, you know what, we're ripping up the, you know, we're, we're, we're using the 14th Amendment, we're clearly subverting the will of Congress, and we're just going to issue treasuries into this environment. You have all of the exact same effects of uncertainty, loss of confidence, short-term negative reactions. And then, like, aren't you presumably expecting in the face of all of those reactions, policymakers to come together and raise the debt ceiling? Or, I mean, so it's, I don't know, I don't see a world in which issuing treasuries in uh, to, to expand federal debt in this environment gets you a better outcome. I just, I, I cannot see it. Sorry, I just said a lot of words there. No, no, like, no, no. I mean, <laughs> way in the we're so, right now we're so far out on the tail of the distribution. Now we're parsing the 0.005% no, out, out there on the tail, uh, hopefully. I don't know that we're so in the tail. I think there's a very decent chance that Treasury finds itself in the position where it misses a payment. Goodness. It seems like there's a, a lot of bad, you know, difficult options on the table absent a clean. Yeah, I mean, if you believe the credit default swap market, I haven't checked it for a few days. This is a thinly traded market, but a few days ago, it was at about a 4% chance of a default. And there's even lots of questions around who gets paid in the event of a default and, and how that would work. Um, you know, my that's view- a default on P&I, right, Ben? I mean, that's, I kind of put that, I put that at a very small percentage. So CDS yeah, so, P&I. So whatever your probability is that there's a default on, default meaning there's a mispayment, then you can either have a mispayment where their uh, P&I can be, either be made or not, right? So the probability for, for a missed P&I has got to be smaller than what we're referring to as defaults by, by definition. Um, but I guess, okay, so the, the, the point I want to make is around the 14th Amendment, where I think that there is... When people say the 14th Amendment, they kind of just say it sometimes. And I'm not even sure in my own head what that really means. Like, does that mean that we're going to go over the X state and then just continuing to issue debt? And I guess the benefit of that is that you don't have to make this terrible decision between paying bondholders and paying Social Security recipients. You could potentially just mechanically just go on issuing debt. There's going to be, you're right, Wendy, 100%. There's going to be enormous market turmoil around it. But potentially, as long as the markets are still buying the debt, you don't have to make that really tough decision. Now, markets may not buy it. And now you have to make even more difficult decisions, right? So like we get this whole failed auction point, And there's a chance that if, that invoking the 14th Amendment could lead to a higher probability of, of uh, a failed auction. So, you know, I, I, I think a really interesting way to sort of put Emily's question was, if you had to advise between invoking the 14th Amendment and accepting the bill that House Republicans passed, which was an off, if those are your two choices, I mean, that bill will throw us into recession. I think one of the most salient costs of that bill that I've heard is around air traffic control, which Mark mentioned earlier. Uh, whereas if, even if you didn't have all these sort of protections for, for veterans benefits and for defense, if you just took it on face value, that could mean an extra two hours at TSA every time you fly. I mean, that would crash the domestic uh, airline industry. And we saw 200 air traffic control towers shut down. So, I mean, I, I really believe that whatever the probability of recession is, if you had to choose the Republican bill, the probability of recession skyrockets. Um, and then you have all the problems that we've, that, you know, Wendy and others and, and Mark have talked about with invoking the 14th Amendment. I mean, this is truly a Sophie's choice. I, I don't know, I don't know what you advise. I mean, there's such terrible options. Sorry, that's, that's not a lot of insight, but um, I mean, my hope is, my hope is, is that House Republicans find some reason here, that they realize that the bill that they have put forward is totally implausible. There's no way the administration can accept it. And when they're negotiating with uh, Shalanda and Steve, that they acknowledge that it's a non-starter that will throw our country in recession and come with much more reasonable asks than the one they've initially presented. Yeah. I know we got so, to move so on. One quick yeah. comment. One quick comment. <laughs> All I'm arguing is maintain optionality here because we don't know what the scenarios are going to be like in the future. And I would not uh, prima facie 
say, no, I'm not doing that because who the know who who the heck knows what the world's going to look like in in three weeks. So I would, and I keep going down the path legally and saying, trying to figure that, you know, what what in fact, how would that work, and how how what are the odds of it working? So I hate to cut in just as things are getting really interesting. I could would love to spend uh, more time with with a bunch of economists switching up the prior assumptions and we could go on and on. But I do have some press questions I would love to throw to you three. Um, the first one is from The Washington Post from Jenny Whalen, who is wondering what are the ways that a default would affect companies? How does that affect bankruptcies or layoffs or other business decisions? So commercial banks and financial institutions more, well, financial institutions broadly in the U.S. hold about $4 trillion worth of treasury securities. Uh, commercial banks that actually have deposits, uh, it's a little less than $2 trillion. They, if, if, if the value of treasury securities fell abruptly, that would massively hit the balance sheets of commercial banks. And that would directly affect businesses uh, that have loans with those commercial banks or want loans with those commercial banks. And then the, la the other thing I'll say is that if, if, you're, if you're a firm in the first half of June and this crisis is going on and you were just thinking, you know what, we were about to just announce a big investment project at the end of this month. We were about to just announce that we were gonna add a shift and hire another thousand people. Chances are pretty good that you're going to postpone that decision and 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 wait until things settle down and you figure out how this is all going to shake out and then multiply that by the entire economy and you get you know you get a a a, a pretty significant pause on economic activity. I say there's two two direct way. Well, that's Wendy's absolutely right. I mean, the one one thing that it recognizes the government is really important to a lot of businesses. I mean, they, they, that's their business. And so if they can't get a check, if they're not gonna get a check from the government, or at least it's gonna be delayed, that's an, an immediate problem that accumulates over time. The second is, and perhaps uh, more existential, is funding. You know, they a lot of big businesses rely on, uh, you know, going into the capital markets to raise cash that they need to maintain their operations. It's kind of what we, we had a similar problem back in the financial crisis for a brief period of time until the Federal Reserve was able to establish the you know various credit facilities to support the 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 funding markets. But that could be an issue as well here too. So there's lots of different ways that you know non-financial corps could be affected directly, independent of what's going on in the banking system. Ben, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, early on, Wendy mentioned money market funds. And and I mean, I emailed a few folks in the financial sector even this morning. It was like, what's the chance we're going to see a run on money market funds? I mean, all of us have now sort of had to, because of what's happened with SVB and Signature, we had to sort of re-remember what a bank run looks like. And, you know, I think that it's probably a low probability event, but this is how credit markets could potentially seize up which is that folks say, look, I don't want to, I don't want to be the last one holding investments in a money market fund. I'm just going to pull my money out. I mean, you know, corporations rely on the money market uh, system in order to get funding. And so this is one way that it could kick off a financial crisis and eventually it leads to a, a larger recession. But the next question is, a legal question. I know we're all economists, but uh, if anyone wants to take a uh, try, the question is, if Biden does invoke the 14th Amendment to ignore the debt ceiling, who would have standing to challenge that question in court? The short answer is I don't know, but I know that somebody must, because if Treasury were to go off and just run an auction and raise a hundred million dollars and throw a party for itself, that would be a problem. And so like Congress really does have the power of the purse. So, you know, there, there are laws that, well, may, maybe I should ask Ben, I think there are laws, right? That constrain what treasury does. So I don't know how those laws get enforced, but, but there are laws. Yeah, I'm not sure who has standing. Uh, there are a lot of people who are thinking about this right now. Um, it's a great question. Anytime I've tried to sort of dabble in, in legal expertise, I've regretted it. So I'll, I'll hold off right now. And I just note that it's, it's a great question. I don't have an answer. Well, 
I, and I, I don't know either, but I would, I would say every treasury bondholder in the world has standing, right? Because you just now devalued, potentially devalued their their bond holdings, and they can say, well, what 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 the heck's going on? And so you can't do that. Uh, so I, I would think my guess is uh, there would be plenty of investors with with standing here. But I, but I, yeah, I that's a I I don't know the answer to that. That's just my intuition. And let's take one last question. We have a few minutes left, which is, since major businesses invest highly in campaigns of elected officials, why are those same businesses not publicly addressing this situation? Well, that's a great question. That's a great question. I'll, you want me to get, I'll take, I'll give you two answers. One, because I've been perplexed by this myself. The one is, I think I've seen this movie before. I know how it's going to end. I mean, I have many clients in the business community and you know, I give lots of talks and they have this one talk coming up and I uh, it's about what could go wrong. And I said, well, maybe we should talk about the debt limit. And the, and the CEO wrote back and said, no, that's just political theater. We don't need to, we, do, we don't need to worry about that. So I think that's one uh, 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 reason. The second, I think I think businesses are nervous uh, about getting caught up in the politicization here. I mean, they see what happened and what's going on in Florida and Disney. And I think that scares them, uh, you know, and, and, and probably appropriately so. And they're very nervous about getting caught up in all of that, unless, you know, there was a, a really, really, really good reason. And this isn't it, because again, this is a movie we've seen the ending to. Yeah. I mean, in, in 2000, in 2021, when we've got a fairly seamless resolution here, and I'd spent a lot of time uh, working at Treasury trying to, to help foster that resolution. For me, I thought the turning point was when President Biden and Secretary Yellen went on TV with Jamie Dimon, Jane Frazier, uh, the CEO of Raytheon, uh, Joanne Jenkins, who's the CEO of uh, ARP, and you had all these business leaders who basically made the case, this is really bad. What Republicans are doing is really bad for the U.S. economy. That was enormously powerful, I thought. Uh, I thought it actually spoke volumes to the Senate, which feels like it's much more reasonable than the House. And to my view, that was a turning point in the 2021 resolution. And so, you know, I think some, I agree with everything Mark said. It's a sad state of affairs when maybe business leaders are worried about retribution for speaking out against something that's so obvious. Um, but business leaders really do have a case here. And it is not a question about whether or not we should address our fiscal deficits. Of course we should. We just shouldn't do it this way. And so my hope is, is that as things start to uh, uh, worsen, which I think they will over the next few weeks, uh, you know, we saw a 17 point decline in the stock market, 17% decline in the stock market in 2011. That starts to materialize again. My hope is, is that business leaders will feel like they have no choice but to speak out against this uh, terrible situation. And Wendy, I'll let you have the last word if you'd like it. So nothing to add on businesses, but I, 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 I hate to give up my prerogative for the last word. <laughs> I, I'm now, I'm now, my mind's moving a mile a minute. You could say Mark and Ben are, are dead on. You could say you could end it that way. I mean, I, in my own mind, I ping back and forth between, well, of course they're going to come to some agreement. Yeah. Of course they are. Uh, but, um, you know, I just don't, I don't, I can't picture it. Well, and the fact that I can't picture it worries me. Well, thank you, Wendy, Mark, and Ben for sharing your insights in this time of tremendous uncertainty. Uh, we really appreciate your taking the time to join us and uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. And thank you to our audi audience for joining us for the conversation. Um, it was our pleasure to be able to uh, present this conversation to you today. Thank you. Thank you.